Greetings from Tokyo. My name is Daisuke Beppu. How are you doing today? I'd like to take this opportunity, if I may, to continue with my comments of the films that have been released in the Criterion Collection. Today, I'd like to talk about Spine Number、no. 4, which is Amarcord. <laughs> This is a film from 1973 directed by a gentleman whose name is Federico Fellini. This is a color film and this is a film in Italian. The gist of the story,、uh, or stories as it were,、um, is that this is a、uh, film that follows a group of people、uh, that are in this town. The town is Rimini. And we follow them over the course of a year、um, as seasons pass, and we encounter their, let's say,、uh, interactions with teachers, their school interactions,、uh, certain events in the town that connect the people.、Uh, there are some scenes involving uh, the uh,、um, uh, uh, fascist celebration parades. And there are scenes involving races and townspeople going to,、um, uh, uh, you know, trying to view a, a, a large ship and trying to、uh, deal with certain、uh, aspects of growing up and adolescence and puberty and、uh, sexual awakening and just. General time passing as lives change. This is a vignette, this is a tapestry, this is a collection of stories that are perhaps in the long run not so consequential in terms of the grand scheme of things because we are, after all, dealing with day to day things. We are dealing with simple happenings that aren't necessarily monumental or life changing. But at the same time, we do get stories that involve. Aspects of life that are quite difficult to deal with, that are quite momentous in a good way or in a not so good way. We are talking about things involving life, involving betrayal, involving sexual awakening, involving growth and maturity and family, and yes, death. So, this is the whole package of this film, which is a series of vignettes、uh, that is、uh, combined to form this overall arching story of this town. And that is Federico Fellini's Amacord in a nutshell. Before I continue, let me just talk very briefly about this Blu ray release. So,、uh, there, are, there is a great commentary by film scholars Peter Brunet and Frank Burke. There is also a documentary which is called Fellini's Homecoming, a 45 minute documentary on the complicated relationship between the celebrated director, his hometown, and his past. Now, this is very interesting because this documentary, among other interviews, includes an interview with the actual real life person who is Tita. And Tita, as you may recall, is the name of the young boy. That we generally follow as the film progresses and we follow his family and his extended family, so Tita. So, the real life inspiration for Tita is being interviewed in this documentary, which is a fascinating, fascinating documentary. Next, we have a video interview with star、uh, Magali Noel. As you know, she plays the very memorable character of Gradiska. Very memorable.、Um, and then we have Federico Fellini's drawings of characters in the film. We have a supplementary called, or supplement called Felliniana, 
which is a presentation of ephemera devoted to Amar Court from the collection of Don Young. We also have archival audio interviews with Fellini and his friends and family by longtime radio film critic Gideon Bachman. We also have a restoration demonstration and a deleted scene and trailer and an optional English dubbed soundtrack. So let me just now move on to some comments about Amarcord. I'd like to, if I may, just talk about some details in the film. And so this might not be a good thing to watch if you haven't seen the film and if you are wary of being spoiled by the film. So I would suggest not continuing on with this video unless you've seen the film or at least know of the film or do not mind being spoiled with respect to certain details of the plot or narrative. This is a very fascinating film for me uh, for a number of reasons. I think First of all, the film is, gosh, how shall I explain it? It is, it is one that I think that I, very pleasantly so, and with great uh, humility, struggle with. And the reason why I struggle with it is I find it to be a, a, quite a, a complex film. And it doesn't seem on the surface to be potentially a complex film at all. I mean, on the surface, it is just essentially a collection of stories set in this town of Rimini about this group of people. Some stories are dealing with Tita and his school friends and his family. And Tita is of an age where he is in puberty, so he is preoccupied with notions of sex and sexual gratification. In particular, he seems to be thinking a lot about masturbation and women, and he and his friends seem to have a lot of attention towards uh, women's rears, and also he likes women's uh, chests. And there is, of course, that famous, famous scene between Tita and the large tobacconist lady and her gigantic breasts, and her breasts almost assaulting him as he's trying to experience this sexual encounter with this large, large woman. So on the one hand, uh, we have this idea of this being kind of a coming of age story, a bit of a, a, a comedy of sexual hijinks, as it were, uh, you know, this tobacconist large-breasted lady scene being one of the most famous and potentially funniest scenes in all of Fellini's work, I would say. Um, so in that sense, it has the, poten uh, the potential for being looked upon as very, being perhaps a slight film or maybe not such a highbrow film. There's a lot of uh, jokes about flatulence and uh, farting and there's um, some rather, I think, uh, some could consider to be quite crude uh, sexual humor as well. So on the one hand, if one focuses on that aspect alone, one might be inclined to think that this is a slight film or perhaps not such an important film. However, if I think about it, uh, I realize or I come to the conclusion that there is so much that is going on here. There is so much that is going on here that is at once immediate and universal, and also that is quite connected to, let's say, uh, Italy of the past, and also contemporary Italy as we know it uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s. And so I think on those grounds, I think this film becomes doubly fascinating or triply fascinating, if you like, and it becomes quite a, a rewarding and challenging film to watch because, as I say, there is more going on than meets the eye. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, I think we can talk about the film in the context of, let's say, Italian history and Italian politics. The idea that the film is set in 1930s 30s Italy, and we're talking about uh, a town that is also dealing with or having to deal with the, the notion of rising fascism. 
Now we see the results of this in a few aspects of the film. So for example, Tita's father is rounded up by uh, fascist authorities and is interrogated and also is forced to drink castor oil, which is a bit of a uh, an unpleasant thing in terms of his bodily functions. So there is a there is something going on here in terms of the uh, submission of the individual to the fascist state, uh, and the submission is total and complete. So much so that even one's body, uh, uh, you know, is subject to uh, their control. In other words, one loses control of one's body. <laughs> that is how bad uh, the fascist regime seems to be. Another aspect of this fascist uh, state, which is expressed in the narrative, is of course the very famous scene involving the parade and, the, um, and everyone, is, uh, uh, being, uh, everyone is outside and then suddenly everything fills up with mist and smoke, which is a great metaphor for the sort of, um, uh, the, this, this notion that fascism isn't really the way. I mean, it really leads to uncertainty and uh, misguidance, uh, just as being in a fog leads one to be confused and losing one's bearing. So it's quite a wonderful, maybe oblique uh, uh, image that is being employed here, but I think one that doesn't uh, escape the viewer. Another way to look at it, which I, re which I referenced, was on a more universal level, which means uh, not necessarily tied uh, specifically to the context of Italy, but more generally in terms of the human experience and the human condition. This idea of youth and the expression of youth and this idea of how does one express oneself uh, when there is basically, let's say, no other outlet for expression. For after all, the school doesn't seem to be providing Tita with any way of expressing himself. There is no story in terms of Tita meeting someone that inspires him to do good. Uh, there's nothing along those lines. He has a very sort of carefree life. When he goes to church, he doesn't think about prayer. He doesn't think about anything. He just thinks about masturbation. And um, uh, he thinks about um, uh, women and he thinks about sexual gratification. And so this could be argued to be that there is nothing in him except the expression of his desire or his base instincts which on the one hand are probably, uh, it's probably not a, uh, it doesn't reflect well on Tita and his friends, uh, but on the other hand I think it reflects quite well because we have ultimately a story about self-expression and how does one so, uh, express oneself. Uh, it comes down ultimately to the impulse as a human and the sexual, the sexual drive, and also the urge to fulfill uh, the need to satisfy bodily functions. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. <laughs> and more importantly, this idea that Tita is growing up into a man, right? Because all the way through the film, we basically see him as a young boy, not struggling necessarily, but maybe failing in terms, for example, of his sexual uh, escapade with the tobacconist. Uh, we see him not being engaged with any, let's say, women uh, on an intimate level or on a, on a uh, uh, let's say, um, a first love type of level. Uh, so we don't get his growth that way, but we do get his growth in a very key point, which is when a very important member of his family dies, and we see him trying to struggle with this pain, and he has to grow up in this moment, and maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, and as time progresses, we'd like to think that he does. So this becomes a key moment in his life, and all of a sudden, all the way up to that moment when we've just seen Tita as this maybe annoying boy or as this boy that maybe doesn't have much in him except what he feels in terms of his instincts, suddenly is thrust into this emotional landscape where he is alone and he has to survive and has to become an adult. And I think at that moment, we as viewers or I as a viewer sympathize with him in such a profound way 
that that moment of the film becomes unbelievably moving and quite stirring in terms of his, basically, his having to deal with the pain of adulthood, but not being prepared for it, which is at once so tragic and at the <laughs> also so real and so human at the same time. There are some pretty dark moments too, you know, the, the father, Tita's father, for instance, saying that he, he wants to kill himself by, by ripping his head open <laughs> through his mouth, or the shot, I think my favorite shot in the, in the film is when Uncle Teo is taken out to the, to the picnic, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a shot there where a little boy um, is going to the baby, in the carriage or in the baby bed, and he's carrying a brick. And so the little boy, the the the, uh, the idea being that the little boy is jealous of the baby, so he wants to kill it with the brick. And that, that's what's so frightening <laughs> and so comedic. And it's that combination of those two uncomfortable and perhaps opposite feelings that I think is the encapsulation of what I love about Fellini. You know, he's not just a man who makes decadent films. He is a man that provides images that are on the surface quite ludicrous and clownish, but when you think and dig deep, they are really hitting at something that is potentially quite frightening and um, uh, quite profound in terms of illuminating upon human nature. And therefore, uh, this film, Amacord, is filled with those sorts of moments. And uh, that is why I really appreciate it uh, quite so much in terms of a film that deals with uh, universal themes of growth and uh, adolescence. Anyway, uh, I hope that was interesting to you. If you have any questions or comments about Amacord, please feel free to let me know at any time. Um, if not, then I hope you will join me because I will be talking next about Spine Number 5, which is a favorite of mine. It is the film The 400 Blows. So until then, I hope all of you are happy and healthy and well and are watching a lot of great, great movies. Until we see each other again, take care.